Team 1540 uh, created the Common Chicken Runtime Engine uh, starting about a little over a year ago. Uh, I'd been on the team for two years and had discovered that our code is always very unmaintainable, always not very good, and wanted to find a way to make that not happen again so we'd actually be able to maintain our code, use things between years, have everything work without quite so much work. So um, it's, the other alternatives to the system are the command-based framework, which some people have used, um, which is provided by WPI, along with you can just use the iterative robot framework directly, which is also provided by WPI. And this, of course, builds on top of those frameworks, um, giving, the, giving us the CCRE. Uh, and essentially, it's just it's a bunch of um, abstractions and libraries to help build FRC programs in, the best, in what we think is a really, not the best way, but a really good way. One of the things we realized was difficult to do was you have to have a robot to debug your robot, right? Well, um, to fully debug your robot, you need a robot. But software usually has several weeks before the robot's there. And if you don't have a robot, you can't do much. Except that we decided we could find a way to fix this. Um, here's the interface for the emulator system of the CCRE. Uh, pretty much, you can run your exact same code as you run your robot. Just press test instead of run. And it go runs in here. And you can see all everything that happens, like I can shift. You can see the solenoid changing. Oh, wait. You can see things like the compressor. So if, if you have custom compressor code, that gets handled. Um, driving, if you're in teleop. Um, and this is, of course, made possible by all of the things the CCRE does in terms of abstractions. Um, so the core uh, thing, the, the, ba the main thing that the CCRE does is it gives you um, the fundamental set of abstractions for running a robot. These are effectively, uh, do it over here, um, uh, three different kinds of data or control data, events, booleans, and floats. Events being button is pressed, autonomous finished, something that happens at a time. Uh, Booleans are on or off. Solenoid is actuated or deactuated. Compressor is on or off. Uh, servo is in this position or that position. Something like that. And floats are, that's a technical term for a number, so that's just any number. So like a motor is a float. It's uh, some gradient amount of, of speed that it runs at. And then we have um, outputs. So like a Boolean output would be, could be a solenoid. It could be a relay. It could be, or it could be half a relay. Uh, um, or like a motor would be a float output. We also, of course, have inputs. So a button on a joystick, that's a Boolean input. And it's an event input. So you can tell when that button is pressed. And you can tell when the button is pressed, or when the button is released, if you want that. Um, and then, of course, there's also another class of things called an input pole. Um, that's more technical distinction. An input means you can say, I want to know when the joystick position changes. And you get to know when the joystick position changes. An input pole is. I don't know when it changes, but when I want to know it, I can know it. So if you look over here in the documentation um, uh, under channel, for example, a Boolean input lets us, um, we, we can do what a Boolean input poll lets us do, which is get the current va state of the Boolean input. Or we can also connect it to Boolean output to figure out, so we can wait for something to happen. And everything you work with in the CCRE goes to the system. You don't have a solenoid class, you have a Boolean output. Um, this is useful because then you can change stuff around however you want, really. And normally, if you had a solenoid and want to change to a servo, 
you have to change every single place you use that solenoid. Or you can do something. I think I have an example here. Let me check. Well, so right here, you're saying make solenoid. Instead of this, I could write um, sorry. And get a uh, servo. Have that be between angles 30 and 60, or 30 and 140, for example. And now, instead of having um, a solenoid to do our shifting, we now have a servo. Now, I don't know why you'd use a servo to shift your robot, but, if you, but that kind of change does sometimes happen. And if you have an, one kind of actuator and change it to another kind, I change that, and suddenly it uses a servo instead of a solenoid, which fixes one of the big problems you can run into when trying to modify your code. One of the other things here, that is that this allows you to um, mix together these very easily. So if I were to show you the entire mixing class, there's lots of different remixing of channels you can do. Like you have, say, a sensor, that, like a button, and you want to know when it's released. Well, you can use mixing dot when, boolean mixing dot when boolean becomes. And um, you don't have to worry about writing a normal loop that runs every cycle and checks what was it this cycle? What was it last cycle? Is it different from last cycle? It's different from last cycle. Now it becomes this. Then we do this. Otherwise, we do this. It's much more simple to just say boolean mixing dot when boolean becomes, which is the, the idea of the system. Um, one of the major changes from, the main, from normal FRC programming is um, instead of writing your main code as uh, one big loop, so Every code runs every cycle, for every 20 milliseconds. That's how you normally do it. Um, what the C series does is you write code where most of it just runs once. So it creates, for example, this code runs when the robot starts. It creates um, some motors and works with joysticks and driving. Um, and the result of this is that you can have, um, you, you can set stuff up and hook it together. It's object composition. And so it's really, you can just, uh, it makes it really easy to attach things as opposed to have a ton of code laid out that, um, and to allow you to work with everything in the right place, which is what traditionally happens. So um, in our code for this, for this last year, our robot um, Apollo, um, we, we had a bunch of different files. Like we had the shooter file, and the shooter file would our main code would go and say, here's these things you need, here's these things you need. But the, sho the shooter itself didn't care about how all the inputs and outputs worked or how it connected to other modules. That was all handled by the main code, which just used the shooter code and said, OK, then send that over to, say, the ARM system so the ARM can't move when uh, we're firing, for example. So uh, that simplified the code a lot. Um, the direct consequence, of course, of having this kind of, of running it once as set up is you can have inline state. So here, um, there is here, I'm saying I want to have this shifting. And when one button is pressed, I want it turned on. When another button's pressed, I want it turned off. When another button's pressed, I want to toggle him between on and off. Now, you could have just on off working with you have a big loop. Every cycle through you check, is the button on right now? If it's on, set of shift high or shift low. And you can do that. Um, then if you want to uh, make it toggle, for example, you need to then add variable outside of your main loop. So then you have to, then you, you have to clutter up the namespace of the main class with variables to keep track of all the state. And so, but doing something like this, the variable is implicitly here, and it's available however it's needed. So um, one thing that exists for all of these is a status object. Effectively, it's a connection from an input to an output. So um, for example, a Boolean status, like I'm using there, is saying, pretend about this virtual thing. 
when it changes, I want the solenoid to change or the servo to change. And then I can say things like, change it when this happens, change it when this happens, change it when this happens, which of course can then read the value like toggling. And also things like event statuses. So if you want to, say, um, be able to have your shooter say, uh, I just finished reloading. And anyone who cares about that should now know. Your, um, your code can have an event status somewhere. And everywhere you want to know about that, you say, you tell that event status to send you whenever something happens. And then when you need to actually cause something, when you tell it that something happened, you just tell it produce. Um, so, that's, that, so that part works pretty effectively in terms of allowing you to make code simpler. One interesting part of the CCRE is that it's not actually limited to FRC robots, though it in pra practically mostly is. Um, the main project is the Common Chicken Runtime Engine. This project is not FRC specific, but it, it contains all of the abstractions for FRC. Or not, not, not for FRC specifically, but like it has the um, inputs and outputs and whatnot, and all of the networking systems and all of the data storage systems. And then we have the Igneous project, which is FRC specific things. Um, so then when we want to run an emulator, we just replace the Igneous layer with the emulator layer. Or if you want to run on different hardware, then you would replace it with something else, like the Obsidian layer. Because um, our team, separately from um, our FRC robot, we also made uh, the Scumbot, which is a big aquatic Roomba, effectively. Huge thing, got two big paddle wheels and a conveyor belt. So it floats around a lake um, in Sun River over in Oregon, which is covered in duckweed, which is really invasive and is killing the ecosystem. And so by having the Scumbot, which is still in development, um, they can go around and scoop up all the duckweed, deposit on the shore, and keep going. Um, and that needed a control system, but we couldn't use the, the FRC control system because that can't run without a driver station. So, and also it's expensive to buy Serial. So we um, got a BeagleBone Black, which is a completely different control system. And I ported the CCRE to it as, as the port CCR Obsidian, and that allowed uh, our software manager in charge of Scumbot to use all of the core abstractions of the CCRE on a completely different pat platform. So next year we have the new RoboRio instead of the CRIO. And the CCRE will, um, once we update the abstractions, your code doesn't have to change at all. The connection to FRC, so the igneous part, is mostly through one big, one big class here. which allows you to um, access anything about an, F an FRC robot. You can get things like battery voltage and the current mode, various joysticks and analog and digital uh, I.O., um, driver station, views, encoders, gyros, servos, solenoids, uh, compressing, and victors and talons and wh whatever else. Um, and so that's, that, that layer then sits between the main, uh, your, whatever raw code you use, and the hardware. Or in the case of the emulator, the window on the screen. The, so the main, main, the main thing that the CCRE does for a team is makes the code more maintainable by allowing you to make, more easily make the different modules and everything for it. Um, doesn't, and uh, lets people test it sooner. Um, and it also, of course, does lots of other things that are very helpful. Like, um, you've probably had, the, if you're on FRC team, you've probably had an autonomous mode. And you've probably run into the thing where you, want, you try your autonomous mode, and then you want to change something about it. And you wait two minutes for the code to download. Now, I can't, we can't always help with that. But um, we have a tuning framework, which allows you to, over the network, just say, change this value to that, if you've set it up like that. And also then, it. It also gives you buttons so you can save that on the robot, and the next time the robot starts up, it uses the same value again. So, for example, here's a place where we do that in example code. Create this new tuning context called autonomous, and um, publishes the buttons so you can save it, and then gets an autonomous timeout value with the value 5. So then um, I can show you this by going over and 
running the poultry inspector as well. Um, we have a cluck layer, which is the networking subsystem of the CCRE. Um, it's uh, fair, it's pretty much a published subscribe network system, so you can have any number of nodes connected to each other with, um, it can be as distributed as you want, but in reality, we mostly use it with two nodes, which are the robot and the poultry inspector, um, which allows us to view all of the objects on the network and interact with them. So for example, um, I can go and, and take the uh, autonomous timeout value that I was just talking about and set it to anything like this. And then when I run autonomous, that's how long it runs for. So then if I set this really low, like that, and when I run autonomous, it does it much shorter. Like that. And of course, you can set it to anything just by going and saying, like, like say we want it to be 10 seconds. We just type in 10 here. And then if you run the, the autonomous mode again, it takes 10 seconds for autonomous mode. And that's without downloading, without restarting code at all, just as it runs, modifying the values. Um, and then we could go over and tell it, go and save the tuning. And then if we were to go and restart the robot, over here, or it's easier to set this up better, but. We're on Thomas again. It takes 10 seconds. So it, it automatically, it will save it on the robot so you can reuse it the next time, which saves a lot of time, for us at least, when um, tuning things like autonomous. We also used it for things like how far the shooter pulled back. So we had our kilowatt seconds of pullback so far, and we'd compare that with a value, and that value could be changed sometimes between every match. And so we, by allowing us to save it like this, um, we were able to adapt to the changing um, rubber uh, tube conditions on the fly that we used to power our uh, catapult. Um, so, that, so that's the section there. Um, you can also use it besides just controlling it from the poultry inspector. Um, you can use it to do something like uh, if you want to have a Raspberry Pi that goes and senses a target and tells you where it is up, up and down. Um, if you have both systems use clock, they can connect to each other, uh, and including automatically reconnecting and everything. Um, and you can just publish it on one, on, you can publish the float input on one of them and subscribe to the float input on the other, and you have the float input on the other as if it was there. So effectively, everything I talked about here, all that, you can send over a clock connection. And then uh, you can pretend that two robots are the same robot, or two different parts of a robot, more likely. Um, and that gives you really effective communication. Um, so for example, if we open up the emulator again, and I'll look at the shifting. Oh, remember how we set it up as a, as a servo? Yeah, that's, that's showing up here. It's all going back and forth. So we set it as, as a servo, so now it uses um, the servo view over here instead. But um, since, we pu since in the code over here, we publish that shifter. Remember, we talked about that earlier. So if we publish it, we can just go over here and take the shifter and then go and just change it right? like that. So uh, the old networking stuff works transparently and in general, you don't need to worry about how it works internally. Of course, beyond that, things like the compressor are made really easy. You do that, and you've got, you have a compressor that works. If you want more advanced stuff, you just replace some of the arguments with something more complicated. Then you have a custom compressor, which does weird stuff wherever you want. Um, we have autonomous modes. So if we have here, um, here's the autonomous mode I showed you earlier. And 
normally you have a few options for autonomous mode. Um, if you use iterator robot, like I think most teams do, then you have to write it as a big state machine. State one means turn on this motor and then wait for this to happen and go to state two. And um, if anyone's, I don't know if anyone here has tried to program autonomous modes, but it can be hard to get state machines to work right. Then you have them spread off, spread out across massive amounts of space, and it's, it's really difficult to work with at some point. So um, we have a, an imperative autonomous mode system. So you can just say, set, um, go forward, wait for this, stop. And instead of having a bunch of interlocking states do all of this, it just goes straight like that um, using thread subsystems, using threads from Java and just going back and forth between that and the main thread. Um, so it improves how you can do autonomous as well, like just wait for time one second. And um, so, so beyond autonomous, um, the, there's also the problem, of course, that the Serio, if you worked with it, runs really old Java, has really old I interfaces, and you can't use um, like normal ways to, to access the file system, for example. So if you want to work with the file system, you've got to do it in a weird way. Then if you do it on a desktop computer, you have to do it in a different way. So of course, that makes the emulator not work. Um, except that we, of course, covered that. And as you see, abstracts it for things like networking and storage um, and a few other parts, like uh, ex exception printing, um, so that you, don't, you can use the exact same code on either, on either a robot or on a real computer or on any other platform, of course. Um, so it makes portability work really well. Um, in terms of, uh, so in terms of why a team would want to use this, of course, there's all the technical parts here. Um, it makes uh, this last season, um, we we had the robot like we had, a, we had a prototype robot like four weeks or five weeks in, and uh, when we got it on the prototype robot, because we had the emulator, we had already tested all of our code as much as we could, of course. And we could just put it on the robot, fix a couple of things, and it worked on the prototype robot. Then we went to the main robot, and it also worked there pretty soon. 90% um, of the issues we experienced were wiring or hardware during that time. Um, so the software integration went really smoothly with the system. Um, and then during competitions, we had like one or two major software bugs the entire season. Um, and besides that, it worked almost flawlessly. Um, we only had a few more than that minor bugs. So uh, it's, one of, it's one of the best years we've had in terms of having our software run well without us having to, um, be, it, without us having to be constantly fixing everything. And of course, um, after we've had an entire season of that, the CCRE is effectively, is almost completely debugged. So any bugs we have next year are probably going to be from our robot code and not from the CCRE, which is, of course, one of the main reason. Of course, uh, worrying about bugs in the system, that is the main reason that someone wouldn't want to use CCRE, because if it breaks during competition, I'm probably not there to fix it for you. And so you need someone on, who, on hand to fix it, unless it's known to not have many bugs. So um, we, we've used it for an entire year. It's worked right there. We're going to use it with Robo Rio because we're a beta team before that goes out. So we'll have, all, we'll have bugs there fixed out, fixed out, fleshed out, flushed out. And so hopefully by the time that, by next build season, um, T-Series should have no major bugs, at which point it won't be an issue for people in terms of having to worry about it breaking. Um, and of course, if you have someone who's good at software, it, you can fix it if it breaks too because there, it, most of the code is fairly self-explanatory in the main section. Some of you have probably had the pro. Some of you on FRC teams have probably had the problem that your code fails during a match, and then after the match, you've got no clue why it failed. Now, this, um, we actually found a solution to this. We have a logging system. So while the robot's running, um, you can 
the parts of the code can say things like simple as shifted or as complicated as there's an error in line 17 in main.java and um, the main thread crashed. And then after the match, since it goes to a file on the serial, you can read what happened during the match. So if it failed during the match, you can see why it failed during the match, um, if it was a, a code issue. Oh, for example, we, d we found a couple of problems this last year by, being, by looking through our logs from a match and seeing things like, well, that actually wasn't a software problem. It did have enough pressure at that time when it tried to fire. That was, that was the hard problem. There, it was too tensioned, and the pin couldn't release. And, um, and that saved us a ton of debugging time by being able to see what happened. Um, beyond just error handling in terms of reporting what happened, the main, a lot of the main systems have uh, error recovery built in. So normally, if your code throws an exception, your code dies, and the robot goes out of control or more likely just stops and doesn't work. That's sort of annoying in the middle of a match. Um, so if your code throws an exception, the C-Serie will most of the time detect that and then uh, restart the next loop as if nothing had happened and just keep running. So if you, run it, if you throw an exception at some point, code will continue to work. And of course, you can find out after the match what failed. But you can, you can find out it will keep running if something doesn't work. Then beyond that, there is the other problem. Once that's fixed, what if you have a piece of code that's failing every single time? Then everything before that in the loop runs, but everything after that doesn't run. So um, to solve that, the system automatically detects when a piece of code is failing over and over again. And it cuts that piece of code out when it, happens for, when it keeps failing for about a second. And then, so if you, a piece of your code fails permanently, then about a second later, your robot starts working again, or the rest of the robot starts working again, which during a match is much, which is nice in the middle of a match if that happens. Realistically, we never had that problem during the main year, though it was helpful while we were debugging our code outside of, this, outside of the um, competitions. But it is nice to know that if something fails, not everything will fail. If you want to know during a match that something fails, Cluck contains a logging system too. So right here, we can see logs from the robot. So if I start autonomous mode then, you can see it started autonomous mode, and then 10 seconds from now, it'll say it ended autonomous mode. So all of that goes and, um, into the poultry inspector as well and is logged there. So you have another copy of your logs on the laptop if you're running the poultry inspector, um, which allows us to check more issues like when we lose connection, was, whose fault was it? Was it the fault of the serial? Did the serial lose power? Did the radio lose power? Did the connection cut by the field? What happened? And sometimes we can, most of the time we can tell, well, that was actually the radio losing power. The serial kept running. Maybe the serial rebooted. We'd find that out too. But we know what happened during the match to cause our communications to fail. And, we wouldn't ha and then we could do something like tape in the radio, ba radio cord more tightly because it wheeled out. Um, and that was very helpful during the actual thing. Um, under normal Java, you have a bunch of collection systems. Like you can have a list, you can have an array. You can have, arrays. You can have a list, and you can have an array list or a linked list. You have a hash map. And on the robot, you can't. Under Java, you can't have those because it's Java 1.3, not 1.5 or 6 or 7. So um, the CCRE actually contains its own implementation of all of that. Um, so uh, you can use collections both on the real robot and both on the robot and on your computer, and don't need to worry about them ha about the robot having really old stuff that doesn't work well, because you can use actual collections and systems. There is a unit testing system to, or as part of verif of proving to people that our code actually um, won't break down in the middle of a match, we have some unit tests for parts of our system. So I can just go and say run tests, and can say 13 out of 13 tests succeeded. And that tests all the really, really important systems like the collection systems and all the statuses, um, a lot of, some of the mixing, remixing of channels, and it verifies that, that 
a lot of that all works, and not, there's not a bug in all that code. Or probably isn't a bug in all that code. But it, it's, no, it's very helpful in terms of that. Um, but of course, you don't need to know all the internal details to use the system. It's designed so that someone who's, say, taking a year of Java could pick up a new system, or in some cases, less than a year of Java could start learning how to use everything. Um, for example, uh, one, one, of the people who, or one of the people who was on the team uh, in software just started Java at the start of the year and could use all of this stuff just fine. Um, we, we tested before the year with our bunny bots systems. So every year our team runs a bunny uh, off-season event called bunny bots, which is a separate game, which is really simple, but um, always involves bunnies. And a bunch of teams out from the area all compete in bunny bots. Um, we have four bunny bots teams. So we have four, four different robots to build before the season. And all of them used the C-Siri last year. So we were able to both test it. And also sh it showed that four um, inexperienced uh, FRC programmers could all learn the system uh, before the season fairly easily. So do you have working for both PWM and CAN interface? Um, we don't have, currently have CAN support right now because we never, we've never used CAN. Okay. Um, but it's fairly easy to add. Okay. Um, the, it, most of it's straightforward in terms of extending with new features. So what you do to uh, add can is you go into igneous and add a call here. Um, and then you dispatch over to the igneous launcher. And then um, we just need to add an interface method, method there for it to make a new can controller. And then you'd go into both the igneous project and the um, emulator project into their launchers. And for example, in emulator, we have um, things like this, so you can it, get, it can access motors. Um, and so then here you just add, you add a, new, a new part to access CAN motors. Do you have any documentation, let's say, for someone who's never seen your code before? Do you, I mean, yes, I see a lot of comments in through it, but let's say it's someone new who's never seen your code before and they want to just do a get a basic start project. It's someone, let's say, someone who's never used it. They have a robot they want to get up, try, start to use this. Is there a document that people get pointed to? We have a series of tutorials on our website. So um, it goes to everything from setting it up to, uh, make it to basic robot stuff to more intermediate stuff and um, a few advanced features of the system. So it's not this, our tutorials are not complete yet, but there are enough to get um, people started. Um, this is what these are. Th this is the new version of the tutorials. The last version of them was used to train our software members for this year, and this version is what we'll, what we'll use for training our new software members next year, as well as what everyone can see online um, who wants to look at the system. So they they can see these tutorials. It's linked to by our thread on Delphi and over here. Um, yeah, we, we have tutorials for it. Does the CCRE work with other programming language other, languages other than Java? Um, the other two languages that we can work with are Py three languages are Python, C++, and LabVIEW. Um, it currently doesn't have support for any of those. Um, LabVIEW wouldn't even make sense. Um, I think Python has some of its own special frameworks. And then C++, it's not available for yet. Um, we are looking into porting parts of it to C++. So, uh, and we especially do that if someone told us that we, they needed it in C++, but no one said anything about it yet. The Java will probably continue to be the master implementation of everything. Could you output the poultry inspector to the driver station? So that way the drivers during the match could see if it was skipping a particular part of the code, so that way they could adjust to it? Um, it they, yes, you can. It runs, that's how it works during match. Okay. Um, our team just runs the poultry inspector alongside the driver station on the same computer. Also, if you, some teams have really fancy control boards with, with ex external buttons and switches and whatnot that they want to be able to read from their software. Um, the old way our team did that was we'd have a, uh, we, we'd have an external joystick controller that was fake and just had a fake joystick. And you had a bunch of buttons and it would connect to that fake joystick. And you'd read it from the robot. And we lost several matches because of that. because. 
of bugs in the driver's station software that you couldn't touch. Um, so the way we've used, we did it the last two years was we used the uh, fidget controller, um, which is a specific kind of external uh, I.O. board you can attach to a computer. Um, so our code has, in C series, has fidget support. So if you run the Poulter Inspector, it'll share, it can share all of the um, I.O. from the fidget board over the network, and then your code can use the fidget. Um, of course, you can use the exact same stuff for anything besides the fidget, or all, similar stuff. So it's not fidget specifically, but you can use that if you want. And that, of course, works with Cluck, because um, the fidget just, get, we just wrap the fidget stuff in Boolean's inputs and outputs and float inputs and outputs and whatnot, then share them with Cluck. And, it's, and everything just works and goes over the network seamlessly. And then we have our external controller. Um, and we're, what we're thinking about doing next year is having an extra tablet that just runs the, the a copy of the Poulter Inspector. And so we could drag out different controls, have the copilot just use a touch screen to control lesser used controls. Um, and that could also connect over the same system. So you, have, you could use a touch screen as well. Okay, question. Yeah. Okay, if someone doesn't know anything about programming at all, mm -hmm. can they still use something like this for their tutorials? Um, they could. Uh, it was not designed for that. So, um, for example, we had to teach a few Java concepts to the people who came in in our um, like anonymous classes. Uh, are we used a lot in code like this, where you say inline new instinct module like that. Um, and it's not, not very complicated, but it is something that we, we did need to teach new stuff to people um, to an extent. Uh, uh, if you have someone who's already there who knows Java and knows C Siri, you could use it as a way to introduce people. Um, if, you want, if someone really wanted to help, they could write uh, more tutorials designed to teach people how to use Java at the same time as C Siri. And we'd put them up here if someone could, did that, or if we had time to do that ourselves, which we don't. Um, but that, that's something you could definitely do if you have someone on hand to help with it. it this was more, this was, the C-Siri was originally designed for intermediate to advanced teams, but we realized it could also be used for beginning teams. Um, you, mostly, it's most helpful if you have a uh, programmer, if you have programmers who are experienced on your team somewhere, like mentors or students who have a couple of years of programming experience. It's where it's most useful. But you can use other places. As people fire questions to you, do you add to your tutorials? Uh, on, if, usually, yes. We, so um, someone was going through our tutorials recently and found and was confused on setting it up, how to run something. And so um, they, to, they had told me that it didn't work. And then they told me their solution. And then I put them in the tutorial. And then everyone else can, can learn from that. It's actually a wiki on Bitbucket, so technically anyone can just edit, go in and um, edit the wiki. Colby, what's next for this? Where are you taking this so, beyond your team? It sounds like there's some more development going on within the system, but where are you moving outside of so, your uh, team in your school? Um, well, our team is going to continue to use it, of course. Sure. Um, Outside of our team, we've been trying to promote it. We released it a ma like a week before build season last year, because mm -hmm. um, it wasn't ready. But also, it had to be released before build season for us to use it during build season. So we had it released then. And no one else would use it at that point. It was unproven to everyone but us. We'd proven it during body bots, but no one else will trust that. Um, but now we've used it for an entire year. And it's at the point where we think it's reasonably well proven that it, it can be used. Um, Obviously not as well as if we, there were 100 teams using it and been going for, for 10 years, but it, it's more so than it was before. We've had a couple of um, other teams starting to look at it, like, uh, I won't name any names, but there's, like, there's a, it's, there, there are a couple of teams who have tried it out and uh, mentors and students, so, or at least people on the team, not the entire team yet, but. Um, so we're hoping we'll get this expanded to a few other teams, and if we're lucky, that means more code from those teams and better library, and then the code, the code will get better and the CTR will get better. So what we want, I don't know if we'll get it, is to have a lot of teams using this so we can have a lot of suggestions for it, a lot of bug reports, a lot of 
um, bug fixes correspondingly, uh, a lot of feature suggestions, get everything a whole lot better, and get, um, which makes it better for our team and better for the entire FC community, who, or, or the part of the community who uses this. Mm -hmm. And even for the community who doesn't use it, um, if we try and push the boundaries on what FRC software can do by what we do with CCRE, that will hopefully help push boundaries other places. Like a few of us on Chief Delphi are looking into um, like trying to run autonomous mode instantly and view the results in a graph. So there's a prototype version of the CCRE emulator which um, graphs the autonomous mode as it happens. And um, we're trying, I'm trying to add in code to that to make it run the entire autonomous, autonomous mode in a, mo in a moment. So you can just chaseling, run, chaseling, run, chaseling, run. And it's even, even faster than retuning. So have you, has your team thought about how you promote this and move um, forward and we have uh, deal with maybe the big success, which would, if, if this does go right, you could have a tiger by the tail. Yeah. So, well, of course, we have Thread on Chief Delphi, which is the main place, which is the place we're promoting it. Um, our team used to host an event called First Fair, and now another team near us does it. It became too big for our facilities, but we're th we teach um, programming classes there usually, and we'll probably uh, add, try and do one about the CCRE there as well, so teams in our area can learn about it. Um, as well, we're a beta team, so we're when we show off our, all, everything we do for beta, we'll also be showing off the CCRE. Mm -hmm. And we plan to do a bunch of that, a bunch of demos and presentations about the RoboReal there, and then probably also include stuff about CCRE when you do that. Do you know how many first teams use John? Um, I think it's about a third. I don't know exactly. Substantial. It's substantial. It's not small. Mm -hmm. um, so we might be able, we'll probably try and expand it to how have, have some mountain C++. Um, I, was ta I, I talked to Brad Miller, who is at WPI. Um, he's in charge of WPI Lab. Um, and there's a chance we can include like, some of the channel stuff in, in WPI Lab. Mm -hmm. We're we don't know yet. We're talking. But if we do, then they would, that would be port that part, at least C++, and then have it in both libraries, mm -hmm. um, which would be cool, and hopefully point people towards our stuff. We don't know. We'll find out. Um, so that is about, that's what I've got so far.